What's going on everybody? Mortem here, this time bringing you my review after 100% for Bioshock, the much acclaimed game originally released back in 2007, however not a title I have ever played before. While I was aware of the game of course over the last roughly 16 years, this is my first time actually playing through the title. But to get my usual stuff out of the way, I review games after 100% all the time to set me apart from other reviewers on the platform, and while that does include the achievements in the case of Bioshock, the remastered version's achievements. It also includes a lot more than that. If you're curious about everything that entails, you can check the description for a video that will explain everything that I cover. And if you're not subscribed and go to my channel, it's also the first video that you will see. My Steam profile is public and linked in the description below as well. Now, I want to kick this particular video off with a bit of general information. For starters, as I mentioned, this is the remastered version that I was primarily using. The remastered version was released alongside the collection or the trilogy of the Bioshock games back in 2016. The main features of the remaster were essentially just updated graphics, full controller support, 4K support, along with adding previously exclusive bits of content such as the Museum of Orphaned Concepts, which is a showcase of abandoned development ideas, and things of that nature. For the most part, it's the same game, but it looks a little better. In that regard, there are two smaller things I'd like to mention, and that is that apparently the AI was slightly affected, though when I heard about this, I fired up the old version and there's not a big difference, but in general, they do react to the environment and environmental effects slightly less. And then the other part of the remaster is the 2K launcher. If you're using this on Steam, and I would presume elsewhere, but I didn't check, the game will load up the 2K launcher. However, the intrusiveness here was very minimal in my experience. You don't have to log in or make an account. It basically just pops up a splash page and you click play, which might very well be changed from how it was originally presented. But if even that is too annoying for you, you can go into Steam's launch options and set it to bypass the launcher altogether. And there's a guide on Steam if you're using that version that tells you exactly how to do that. It's very simple. From there, let's actually talk a little bit about the game itself. So as I've already mentioned, it released back in 2007, but it is an FPS sort of RPG hybrid. There's a huge emphasis on the narrative itself, which is pretty well done. While the gameplay of the title has definitely aged over the years, it's a bit less impactful, I would say, than more recent entries. But for a game of this age, I think that's pretty forgivable. But Bioshock is nonetheless an an incredibly highly praised game. And while playing through it in this day and age, I think at least is somewhat deserved, in other parts, not so much. But one of the interesting things about Bioshock in particular is that its development was very troubled. Doing just a little bit of history on this game for the review revealed a multitude of conflicts and inner turmoil behind the developer, with a great many people who worked on the title leaving after its completion. And given that development cycle, it might come as no surprise that the game itself transformed many times over during said development, and while aspects of the original concepts and everything remain, much of it is quite different from what was originally imagined. And apparently, in even some closed testing roughly six months before the game's launch, it received a huge amount of negative feedback that they took to heart, changed, reworked. For instance, some of the accents and characters were vastly different and were changed in response to this feedback. And I tell you all that because it's almost somewhat surprising to me to read all of that about a title, only to then see it become, again, one of the most highly praised games out there. Which is an interesting little story, if nothing else. But with all of that out of the way, let's talk difficulty and New Game Plus. So the first thing to know is that Bioshock is a relatively short game. You can probably beat it between 10 to 15 hours. It's relatively linear, and while you can go back and explore previous areas, there's not really a ton of reason to. And in my case, I only really needed to do that for a couple of achievements, and that was pretty much it. So naturally, with games like that, New Game Plus is a nice addition that can give you some more playtime, while also allowing you to approach higher difficulty levels a little bit easier. Which brings us to the difficulty. Ultimately, there are four of them, essentially easy to survivor. Now, on a fresh start, the difference between these is pretty noticeable. Though on New Game Plus, survivor is much more manageable with all of your upgraded weapons and abilities. Though the only real difference between all of the difficulties is the damage enemies are dealing and the health that they have. 
Though ultimately, while Survivor can be a good challenge, it is far from unapproachable. If anything, it might just encourage you to use more variety and combos, as even on normal, it's a relatively relaxed experience. I started the game on normal, ran through it once, died twice, then checked out parts of the game in easy and hard and short bursts, and then did another full run in Survivor to get the last few achievements. And if anything, again, Survivor just encourages you to use more of the tool set, which just isn't really necessary on lower difficulties. But all of that brings us to the story and my thoughts on it. So, the story is probably both the best and most discussed aspect of this game, so naturally this section of the video will be full of spoilers. I'm going to talk about some important plot threads, etc., so if you yourself have not played this, the rest of the review should be pretty well free of that kind of stuff outside of maybe contextual things in the footage, but the story section here, which will be timestamped, will definitely be full of spoilers. So, with that said, the game starts with our character, Jack, on a plane, above the Atlantic Ocean. There is a plane crash after we look at a note that we miraculously survive and we come above water directly in front of a lighthouse. With it being the only landmark around, we swim towards it and find that this is an entrance to the city of Rapture which is an isolated utopia, or at least it was at one point, that made huge leaps and bounds in terms of scientific advances that led to the formation of plasmids, which are genetically altering substances that allow the use of basically superpowers, shoot lightning and fire from your hands, among a variety of other things. As we descend into Rapture and start taking stock of what is going on in this place, we learn that it's essentially descended into complete chaos with people addicted to the substance of atom, which is the base material that facilitates the use of the plasmids, having pretty much all gone insane and turning on each other, leaving all but a couple of people alive. Now your initial task is to search out a man's family, who he is trying to save from the owner of the city, known as Andrew Ryan. However, along the adventure, you can learn more and more about some of the scientific experiments that were taking place here, which includes things like mental conditioning or brainwashing, alongside with some pretty horrific experiments done to children, all of which was the result of the infighting between two people, Fontaine and Andrew Ryan. And ironically, somewhat because of their ideals opposed to things like government and outside interference, this conflict is the direct cause of all of the chaos that you see. Rather than step in and take any preventative actions, all of this was essentially allowed to transpire because of the feud between these two. And once you finally get to Andrew Ryan in order to stop what you believe is a crazed madman, you find out that Atlas, the person who has been helping you this whole time, or so you thought, is actually using a form of mind control on you. Because you are not here by accident. You are actually Andrew Ryan's son, at least genetically, using all of the experiments that took place in this place roughly 20 years before the start of the game, they made you, filled you with a bunch of mental conditioning, and then when the time was finally right for Fontaine to strike back at Andrew Ryan in an attempt to take control of all of the Atom as well as the city itself of Rapture, they called you back from your life on the surface back to the city of Rapture. You are actually the one that caused the plane to crash after you read the trigger phrase, would you kindly, on the plane, which is a phrase that Atlas has been repeating to you frequently. Now, I think this reveal largely works simply because would you kindly kind of sounds like the sort of old-timey phrase you would hear at roughly this kind of time period, which leads you to be unlikely to question it without some beforehand knowledge. However, it turns out that this phrase is the trigger for your mental conditioning that you then need to break so you can fight Fontaine after Andrew Ryan effectively uses you to commit suicide. And while that's easy enough to gloss over in a summary, I think the game handles it very well. It wastes almost zero time in terms of its narrative, it uses every second of it, it was a great plot reveal, and it really does a lot for the story, but even the story beyond that is rather interesting. And while I think the narrative is great and a lot of the characters were really well handled, there are two different endings that come down to a mostly pointless choice you've been making up to that point, which is to save or harvest the Little Sisters. Little Sisters are guarded by Big Daddies, which are people surgically grafted into diving suits to protect the Little Sisters, and the Little Sisters are scavenging Adam from dead bodies. 
In order to gain the power you need to get through the story and the levels, you kill the big daddies to get to the little sisters, which can provide you with Adam. You can either harvest them or rescue them. Theoretically, harvesting should give you more Adam, and rescuing them should give you a little less. Ultimately, this pans out to about the same. There's a roughly within 10% difference. However, harvesting the little sisters will lead you to the bad versions of the ending, and rescuing all of them or all but one of them will give you the good ending, which is canonical from what I understand. But with the way this was handled, I have to say that there was very little, if any, weight to these choices simply because the reward is about the same for either one, and pretty much the only thing this really impacts is the ending itself, and a minor scene or two here and there, but that's pretty much it, so it feels a little underwhelming, which stands a bit in contrast to the rest of the narrative. All of that brings us to our progression systems, of which there are a few, which primarily comes down to your plasmids, your tonics, atom, and weaponry, the simplest of which is your weapon weaponry. You will gain access to all sorts of guns as well as a wrench to take on enemies with. By finding select terminals, so to speak, throughout the game or upgrade stations, you can upgrade a weapon at a station one time, which is usually its fire rate and then its damage, with each weapon only having two upgrades. But there are enough upgrades to upgrade every single weapon in the game for one run, which means you can max all of them out. Then we have plasmids and tonics. These are essentially just active abilities versus passives. Plasmids are the actual sort of superpowers you get, and you obtain these by finding the plasmids in the world and injecting yourself with them, which works effectively the same for the passive abilities, but they're just called something different. However, you can only have so many of these equipped at any given time, which is where Adam comes in, as well as the upgrade system. So if you skipped the story section altogether, we collect Adam by finding little sisters and killing their guardians, big daddies. Once we get the little sister, you can harvest or rescue them for a set amount of Adam. And while this is presented as a moral dilemma, the reward for both is within 10% of each other. But once you get Adam, you bring it back to another upgrade terminal where you can purchase various health and Eve upgrades, unlock more slots to actually put all this stuff into, as well as the abilities themselves. Now, when it comes to equipping all of these things, you get four tracks. One of those tracks being for the active abilities themselves, and then several subcategories for various tonics, which are broken down into things like tech, combat, you know the drill. So using Adam, you unlock slots to equip more stuff as well as the stuff itself, along with upgrading your health and Eve. Eve is basically mana. This allows you to use the active abilities, so certainly important to note. And then last but not least, in terms of progression, a little ways into the game, you get access to a research camera, which will allow you to take pictures of enemies. And as you gain research levels on each of these enemies, it will increase the damage you do and some other benefits here and there. But I would say the main thing is increasing the damage you deal to them. And all of that brings us to our gameplay and world section. As I've already mentioned, the game is a more or less linear track. However, at certain points, you can back travel to previously cleared levels, and enemies and the like do typically respawn outside of a few instances, which will allow you to gather up materials you may need outside of Adam, or potentially research enemies that only appear in roughly one place, that kind of thing. On top of this, there are sort of upgrade and shop vendors, which are effectively just vending machines that you'll find around, where you can spend the money that you're gaining off of enemies and finding in the environment for things like ammunition or various helpful things like the automatic hacking tool. You can also gather up crafting resources and use one of the upgrade terminals to just craft. With yet another one allowing you to sort of change your loadout, this one's called the gene bank, in case you want to change something for a particular fight. Using all of these, the game largely avoids sort of character menus, but rather you walk up to these set points and then activate these things there, which outside of your current objective and a map is pretty much the only menus you'll You'll see. Now, almost all of these can be hacked in some way, which will typically reduce prices, reduce the cost of materials, or in the case of certain enemies, just turn them onto your side to help you fight enemies, such as turrets or security bots. Though it must be said, the hacking mini game, while fine at first, gets 
very annoying very quickly, which is where the automatic hacking tools that let you skip it come into play. As basically you just reveal a bunch of tiles and then try to make a clear path from one side to the other, with some of these being very, very annoying. And while that might be how these sort of layout and gameplay mechanics are, what is much more intriguing about the world itself is rather the atmosphere, which is really, really well done. The city of Rapture is an incredibly discomforting place to be. Almost everything about it has this sort of dreary sense of unease. And given that you are technically below the sea, the pressure from the water is both literal and metaphorical, with much of the interiors being these sort of bloodied and battered renditions of 1940s Art Deco, which does a fantastic job of representing all of these sort of hopes of these powerful people and this city they built being smashed into nothingness by their addiction to both Adam as a substance and, let's be honest, their own power, making your descent under the sea into rapture almost reminiscent of a metaphorical descent into madness as you see what rather horrific things these people were up to, all while hearing it from them via audio diaries, etc. And all of it is just this incredibly oppressive space. And that's before it even starts throwing enemies at you, which conveniently brings us to the combat section of the title. Now, truth be told, I think the combat, while I wouldn't call it bad, it is the weakest part of this title. A lot of it feels very floaty, it lacks impact, the range on the wrench doesn't make any sense, in the sense that you have way more range than you think you do. Enemies in general tend to mindlessly charge outside of a few instances, though I do think some of these shortcomings are helped along by by the plasmid powers. Many of these powers, like lightning and fire, will interact with the environment in various ways, which can lead to a little bit of puzzle solving or finding unique solutions to problems, especially with things like telekinesis or target dummy, etc., which, combined with all the various types of weapons, gives you a decent amount to do over the course of a 10 to 15 hour story, but after a few hours you've pretty much seen what the game has to offer, which means it's going to get repetitive quick, especially against the relatively tame enemy variety. So while you can do fun stuff and that helps it from being completely bad, much of the combat just lacks impact. Nonetheless, in spite of those things, for a 16 year old game, I think it holds up well enough for you to enjoy the story, even if it's not great. Last but not least though, we have the challenges before we start wrapping this thing up. The challenges are essentially little puzzles rather than taking part in any kind of the main game. You access these via the menu. They're just separate little missions that you can take part of that aren't canon in any way, but rather just fun representations of what is possible with the system and using some of the game's mechanics in unique ways. And as these challenge rooms, as they're called, start you out with no weapons, equipment, anything like that. You have to scrounge all of it which again forces you into an almost puzzle-like nature of the challenge rooms themselves, at least for the first two with the last one being simply a set of combat arenas, it can give you some extra fun once you're done with the rest of the game. Though all in all, nothing too spectacular. And that brings us to our Steam Deck compatibility section. And this game runs pretty well on the Steam Deck. It has a playable rating from Steam for what I think is some pretty benign reasoning which is simply that sometimes Bioshock will give you compatibility warnings if you're playing it on Steam Deck, but the game still works anyway. And then if you want to rename your saves, you have to use the in-game virtual keyboard, which isn't something I ever really bothered to do, so it didn't affect me at all. But because of those two things, rather than being great on deck and verified, the game is given a playable rating. Though I would tell you with the full controller support and everything from the remastered version, alongside cloud saves, etc., this is a great game to play on Steam Deck, even if you're terrible with a controller like myself. And beyond those very, very minor issues, it ran great otherwise, didn't really have any other problems out of it, and it can be a pretty enjoyable experience. But that brings us to our positives, negatives, and then we will wrap this thing up. Now, on the positive side of things, as you might have guessed, the story and the narrative I really enjoyed. And while I was somewhat aware of the story pre- going into this game simply because it's hard to ignore that kind of thing completely over the course of 16 years since it launched. It still was full of great moments, fun bits of storytelling that I loved seeing firsthand. The narrative is very good. On top of that, the atmosphere
atmosphere and environment is wonderful. Rapture is as much a character as any person in this game, and if anything, I wish I had gotten to explore more of it because it is creepy and off-putting with a veneer that is basically soaked in blood. But nonetheless, negatives, as I mentioned, the combat in particular, it's just not very good. One thing I didn't actually mention in the combat section, if you die, you get sent back to a Vita chamber, which is basically just a respawn point, but that respawning doesn't affect enemies' health at all, meaning that it's right where you left them when you died, which is one of many reasons combat lacks weight and makes it easily the worst part of the game. It's serviceable, yes, and because of the age of the title, I think it's relatively forgivable, but it is nonetheless not great. And then there are the morality choices with the little sisters and whether or not you harvest or rescue them, and then this affects the ending, and they try to tell you that you're going to get a less reward for rescuing them, but it's basically the same reward. A lot of that just really fails to have any impact, and then it has this effect on the actual ending that seems a little out of place, given that it's not a huge part of the story to begin with. And while that's presented as this sort of like moral dilemma, that really failed to land for me, which is a shame because they could have used that to implement a sort of choice-based difficulty where rescuing them resulted in less atom and thus making the game difficult for you. But that's not really what happens at all, so it just feels off. And all of that brings us to our conclusion. Now, I know you're waiting with bated breath for the 16 years it took me to check out this title, and will solely be basing your purchasing decision off of this video. Well, 16 years is long enough, I say. The game is very good, obviously I recommend it, but the combat is not the best. That said, the game is selling for $20 US on Steam, which comes with both the original as well as the remastered mastered version, and you can regularly find it on sale for much less than that, which might be worth doing because a remastered version that is basically just a higher resolution support and high res textures, along with a few minor bits of content, for a 16 year old game might make even $20 seem like a bit much, at least for what you're getting. That said, again, I doubt that is of much concern to the people watching this video. So ultimately, it's a great game overall, the story's incredible, the gameplay left me a little underwhelmed with how much people had hyped it up, but it hardly detracts from how great the narrative and setting were, which makes me glad to have finally filled in this piece of my missing gaming knowledge, so to speak. So with all of that said, I certainly hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz, but regardless of any of that, truly, thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.